And I think in the early days, I'm talking the 1930s, 1940s, they didn't really know what they were dealing with. They also did not understand the technologies. And uh, I think that they also didn't know why these visitors were here. For example, the big increase in all the sightings around the world happened at the time when we began to detonate nuclear weapons. This is not an accident. And I've been told by senior intelligence officials that essentially a big red flag went up over our planet saying we were in trouble. But not only are we in trouble, but we could be a threat to others because you combine going into space, the early stages of space travel, and the use of uh, hydrogen bombs and nuclear weapons, uh, and a civilization on Earth that was still very violent as you look around the earth even today of course. So this is something that any enlightened or even uh, self-interested civilization observing the earth, which I think we've been under observation for thousands of years, would be co greatly concerned. But our military uh, and government uh, were uh, completely shocked by this and didn't know what to do of it. I think that's the early, but later I understand, of course, President Eisenhower wanted to make an announcement about this after he had a meeting uh, in Ed near Edwards Air Force Base in 1954, but he was prevented from doing so by what he later called the military-industrial complex because the interests for secrecy are really fall into uh, three broad areas. One is the inertia of the secrecy. Once you start something secret, and you have made so many lies and frankly killed so many people and threatened so many people and you've lied to Congress and you've lied to presidents. And you know, how do you bring this out? They painted themselves into a black box, black corner. The other, so that's the inertia. The other is that there were orthodox religious interests that did not know what to make of this. And I've had discussions with senior levels at the Vatican to discuss this. And today, most mainstream religious groups would say, well, there's one supreme being in the universe, and there are many children of God, and we're all children of God. This is what Monsignor Balducci said when we interviewed him at the Vatican. But the Orthodox and fundamentalists would view this in a very a, a disturbing way, because it would upset their worldview. And I think then the biggest became the technological and scientific end of this. Once we retrieved, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, several of these extraterrestrial vehicles and began to study them, we combined that knowledge with knowledge we already had. Because remember, we had some people like T. Townsend Brown and the Beefield Brown effect who were studying anti-gravity quite independent of this issue back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But when their information got combined with studying these spacecraft, they figured out, ah, oh, this is how they're working. And they realized it's the end of oil. It's the end of the need for coal. It's the end of the combustion engine, the internal combustion engine. It's the end of uh, transmission lines for electricity. Because the energy that these spaceships are using, what people call UFOs, we don't call them, no one in the business calls them UFOs. They are not unidentified and they don't fly. It will get to this. But these objects are extracting energy from the fabric of space, okay, around, not outer space, but the fabric of space. And in fact, even the early uh, Lockheed and Northrop experimental spaceships that we have built and we're talking 1950s and 60s, were called flux liners because they were pulling energy from the quantum flux field, what's called the quantum flux field that's in the space in this room. And every cubic centimeter of space, for example, in this room has enough energy to run the Earth for a day. It's a huge amount of energy. And so once this was um, really figured out by the mid-50s, a long time ago, 50 years ago, they knew that this would be the end of the oil cartels and the international financial petrodollar system and a huge amount of the industrialists would then have to change their whole way of operating. Because think about it, what happens when every village in India or Sub-Sahara Africa can have a device that looks like a generator 
and it's extracting energy from this quantum flux field, suddenly you have an economic growth uh, all over the world. And this is a wonderful thing. It would be the end of poverty. But it would also be the end of the economic hegemony where Europe and America, with 600 million people, dominate the whole global economy of 6 billion. So this is a huge geopolitical problem. And so the issue isn't about just money, it's about power. Who has the power? How the earth is run? Who is running earth? And then you have another issue. And that is, there are people who view the world as they understand it. And in, the, in America we have a saying, if you wear rose-colored glasses, you see everything in the world is rose-colored. But if you're wearing glasses that are conflict-colored, colored with a sort of paranoid and militaristic view of the world, you're going to view these visitors as a threat. And you're going to respond to them as a threat, even though there's no evidence that they're a threat. I want to be very clear on this. There's no objective evidence that anyone has been harmed by these visitors. And there's certainly no evidence that they're a threat to us. There's a lot of evidence, however, that they're concerned about our threat to the peace and the order of space. Why? Because our technological capabilities and our weapons have surpassed our social and spiritual development, clearly. And we are at that stage in the evolution of a global civilization where our science and technology has gotten way out there, but our social and spiritual is lagging. And this is that danger zone. And Earth is in this danger zone now. And they know this. These visitors from other civilizations, other planets, know this. So, unfortunately, I think that they have had a great concern about our nuclear facilities. We know this. We have colonels and uh, lieutenant colonels who was Strategic Air Command and the Atomic Energy Commission who have testified at DisclosureProject.org that every single one of our nuclear weapon storage areas have been visited by these ET spacecraft because they were obviously concerned. And in uh, the Soviet Union also, in Russia. We have uh, spoken to people with the KGB and, and with their space command. And so it's clear that they have that concern, but that doesn't mean that they're hostile towards Earth. I think they're concerned about human hostility. And I think, however, this has gotten misinterpreted because here's the risk. In the vacuum of secrecy, when you have this vacuum of secrecy, it's very easy, very easy to begin to believe your own worldview and there's no one telling you differently. This is the danger of a program being hermetically sealed and kept this secret because they do not get the perspective and it's gotten out of control. And Eisenhower said when he left office in 1961, beware the military industrial complex because it can become a threat to our security, our way of life, and our democratic institutions. And he was a five-star general and a conservative Republican, but he was very concerned. And why? We have people who worked with him in the White House at that time who have told us who are witnesses for our group, that he had been stabbed in the back by people who wanted to keep this secret and actually trumped or violated his presidential power and took these projects and hid them and hid them deeper and deeper and deeper. This is a very dangerous thing in a world where you're dealing with technologies this powerful. And uh, this was, of course, President Clinton's frustration. President Clinton asked Webster Hubble, who was third in command at Justice, to look into two things. And this is in his book, Webster Hubble's book, Friends in High Places. Clinton wanted him to find out about what are these UFOs and, you know, well, who's keeping it secret and why. And who killed Jack Kennedy? Because Jack Kennedy was his hero. Well, we discovered there was a connection. But, uh, and his CIA director, R. James Woolsey, was equally worried because when I met personally with Woolsey here in the Washington area in December of 1993, he was very gravely shaken by the fact that there was a secret cabal 
or a whole level of government and corporate activity dealing with this issue that was lying to him as the CIA director and as also to the president. So this is a very serious problem. And the, so the secrecy uh, is related to a number of related issues. One is this inertia that happens when you have this large ongoing historical uh, problem of secrecy. The other is uh, certain orthodoxies of both religion and science that people don't want out. Because obviously, if you own a trillion dollar oil field or a company that's uh, assets are in that range, remember, uh, this is not particularly good news for you. It's good news for humanity and for the earth and for the environment. But there's only a few hundred people in corporations who really control the world economy. And this information would change forever their grip on that power. Now, they would still have a lot of money, but it's not about money. You and I think of money, can I afford to put my son or daughter to college or buy a home or what have you? They're viewing it as power, the geopolitical control. So it's a power issue. And this would change geopolitics forever.